in some way. Should we start? Or again, yeah, not yet. Can just second, please. Yeah, 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 sure. Yeah, now it's live. Okay. So let me introduce today's topic. We're going to talk about the Hollywood's Dirty Dirt. We have two invited speakers and we're really delighted that they're coming from Southern California. We have Jim Fran Franca from Los Angeles, you. USA. Franco, sorry. And Matthew Pendleton from Ontario, Canada. So let me introduce and say a couple of words about our speakers. Uh, Dean is a practicing California professional geologist and certified engineering geologist for Shannon and Wilson, has over 35 years of experience. Dean has been conducting and managing projects involving engineering geology for engineered facilities, including landfills, mines, railroads, light rail transit facilities, interstate highways, shoots, treatment plants, power generation plants, and pipelines, as well as large scale residential developments and schools. His experience includes working on both private and public funded projects from single lot homes to 10 mile long freeway corridors. Dean has investigated active faults, landslides, tar sifts, springs, and other geological hazards. His groundwater experience includes pump test and well installation, and he has worked on studies for landfills, industrial facilities, and gas stations. Dean has worked on project sites spanning California from the southern border to the Cascades, and he also has experience with sites in Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, and Montana. He's a member of the AEG Southern California chapter, serving as vice chairperson since 2017. Together today, we have also Matthew Pedleton, who is actually the chairperson since 2016 in the Southern California chapter. Matthew is a PhD student in physical hydrogeology at the University of Waterloo in Ontario, Canada. And he's also practicing California professional geologist and certified hydrogeologist for projects based in California. He has seven years of experience as an environmental consultant. His work spans stormwater compliance projects and hydrogeology investigations. In stormwater, Matthew helps California developers facing regulatory enforcement to develop strategies to minimize construction site stormwater pollutants like muddy waters from entering surface water bodies. In hydrogeology, he investigates and remediates soil and groundwater chlorinated solvent contamination from the soils below industrial facilities. Matthew is an active member of the Association of Environmental and Engineering Geologists. And as I mentioned, he is currently still the secretary and chairperson since 2016. So thank you both for being here. And I think the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Stratus. Well, I wanna thank everybody for attending uh, today's meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to speak in front of an international audience. It's the first time I've been able to do that. Um, but what we're here for today is to talk about Hollywood's dirty dirt. It's both environmental and engineering geology professions in Southern California. Um, and as Stratus said, I'm Dean Fransu and with me today is, is Matt Pendleton. And each of us is gonna talk a little bit about what we do um, for private companies here in Southern California. Uh, Stratus has already kind of gone through our, our backgrounds, but again, I'm, I've got about 35 years of experience, uh, graduated from, from university uh, in 1987 and have been practicing ever since. In California, what we do have uh, what's called a licensed professional geologist. Uh, and so I'm a PG. And then also a subset of that is what's called a certified engineering geologist. So that's a certification as part of being a PG. And Matt, why don't you go ahead a little bit about your, your background? Yeah, and I'm like Dean, I'm a professional geologist in California and each state in the United States has their own licensing uh, board. Some of them do and some of them don't actually, not every state has a licensing board. And I uh, also carry a specialty license. I'm a certified hydrogeologist. And to uh, just so everybody knows, so Dean and I work in different sectors in Southern California. I'm I'm on the environmental side, so I work for an environmental environmental engineering environmental consulting firm. 
whereas Dean works for more like geotechnical engineering geology consulting firm. And so the two of us would kind of work in tandem together for the same client, but we wouldn't compete on the same projects because we have different specializations. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna present today. And, and the big thing here is what engineering and environmental geology is like in Southern California and part of Southern California is Hollywood. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the Los Angeles area geologic framework, which drives a lot of what we do. We're gonna talk about three separate different types of projects that are common here in Southern California. One is a large scale grading development. The second would be a commercial development uh, and then uh, the third is, is, a, is a development that, that both Matt and I worked on where we had naturally occurring subsurface hazardous materials. So a little bit odd, but in some ways similar to a lot of what's gone on here in Southern California. And we're going to wrap up the talk today with, with takeaways, both from, from myself and from, from Matt with the, our experience on the projects that we've worked on here in, in, in Southern California. So Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about Los Angeles and, and the story of development here in the city? Yeah, Dean, so, um, uh, well, starting out, uh, Los Angeles got its first railroad in 1876. And this is important to the story of both environmental and engineering geology, because not only are there, um, you know, geotechnical and engineering designs that go into the design of, of uh, railroads, such as, putting in tunnels and regrading and making sure there aren't earthquakes or faults that undermine uh, railroads. And railroads are also important to, from an environmental perspective because they carry contaminants. So they don't carry contaminants, but they carry goods. And uh, they also carry chemicals that are gonna be used in industry in the heavily industrialized area of Los Angeles that it is today. And so uh, a lot of our site environmental site investigations include some element of evaluating for whether or not there are railroads because they carry chemicals oftentimes. It, by 1923, Los Angeles became one of the world's, uh, uh, we were producing a quarter of the world's oil supply. And it's still heavily a lot of oil and um, natural gas refineries are in Los Angeles. And this gives rise to something we're gonna talk about today. Um, and then in World War II era, 1941 to 1945, there were aircraft ships, war supplies and ammunition supplies being uh, created in Los Angeles area. Pictured on the bottom right are some women assembling fuses in the Burmite Powder Company in Saugus, uh, which is in Southern California. And there's a lot of, um, chemicals that are used in producing these rocket fuels and ammunitions that got into soil and groundwater. Starting in 1950, the site, the whole Los Angeles became a lot more uh, industrialized and a lot of commercial development. And that's led to a lot of what Dean and I are working on a lot of the time is redeveloping these former industrial facilities into present day uh, residential facilities. And now Dean, why don't you give a little bit of background on the geologic underpinning of the, of the region? Yeah, practicing here in Los Angeles County in Southern California is, is a unique in a lot of ways. And, and that's true for a lot of coastal California. And that's because of the geology here and the fact that we've got, it's, it's an active, uh, active geology, basically. Los Angeles itself or Los Angeles County here is that large um, light yellow area kind of to the south end of, the, of that blue outline. But Los Angeles County itself is composed both of sedimentary basins, which are those light yellow areas, as well as, as um, mountainous areas. Um, the elevation change goes uh, from, from sea level all the way up to over 10,000 feet here in, in the county. Um, and what you'll see here on the map, uh, is different, different uh, types of the geology and bedrock geology shown in pink, green, brown, grays, uh, and reds. And then uh, interspaced within those areas and actually within the lighter areas, which are the, the alluvial basins, you'll see a number of thin black lines which represent faults. Many of those faults are what we consider here in California active. And that means they've moved in in the Holocene. So basically the last 
11,000 years. <clears throat> and because of that, that bit, actually, there was a major earthquake in Southern California in 1971. And in 1972, the state government passed a, a law called Alquist Priolo that basically said, if you want to build a new structure, it cannot be on top of an active fault. So any habitable structures cannot be placed on habitable faults. And that, in many ways, changed the uh, the 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 uh, careers of a lot of geo practicing geologists in Southern California. It created a lot of uh, new jobs and a lot of new work for the development that goes on here in Southern California, basically 365 days a year. And Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about some of some of this, the materials where you will find uh, contaminated soils? Yeah, and in Los Angeles, um, we, as environmental geologists, a lot of what we work in is the quaternary alluvium. So sediments being deposited at the foothills of larger mountains of plutonic or sedimentary rocks um, that are shedding sediments over, you know, millions of years to lay down the, the foundation of these large plains on top of which Los, the city of Los Angeles was built. And Los Angeles is like a big desert. There's we have very shallow to very deep groundwater ranging from tens of feet to hundreds of maybe five, three or 400 feet below ground surface. So the depth of water it really varies and it depends on where you're at inside of these alluvial, alluvially deposited uh, basins, essentially. And in my work, a lot of what I work in is, is contamination chlorinated solvents like tetrachloroethylene or trichloroethylene, which are degreasing and uh, dry cleaning solvents that are used um, and get into different types of soils, clay, silt, sand, and gravel. Oops, sorry about that, Matt. Oh, are, that's okay. Well, I'd like to start, and, and, and as, as we were saying previously, um, we're gonna talk about three different types of projects we've worked on. Here in Southern California, the first one that I'd like to talk about is Golden Valley Road and High School. And this is a project I worked on in 2000, well, starting in 1999, we did the design and then construction in 2001, and two, two, between 2000 and 2001. And this particular project was a four lane to six lane connector road that connected to a brand new high school campus, proposed high school campus. And this is typical of many large scale grading jobs uh, here in Southern California, where a lot of uh, earth will get moved because of a proposed development. So in this particular case, it was about a hundred acre site. The challenges included both uh, slope st uh, stabilization, active faulting, landslides, and major regional utilities that cross the site and how we had to avoid those, those utilities. Uh, this next slide is a photo of the site a map to the, to the right or aerial photo to the right showing some of the obstacles that we had to, to uh, basically work around. This particular project, we moved 8 million cubic yards, roughly 8 million cubic meters of material to make this, this project. And as, is, as I was saying, as is typical in Southern California, um, because of the hillside development that we do here, Basically, developers want to take a, a site that's got a lot of elevation change and make it as flat as possible. And they do that with heavy equipment. They'll do that with bulldozers, scrapers, other types of uh, heavy, heavy equipment, um, and to basically flatten out a site so that they can build on top of it. The challenges on this particular site were a uh, high pressure gas pipeline that came from halfway across the continent. It was two, actually two 30 inch high pressure gas pipelines, which are shown here as a yellow line on the map. Part of that line had to be basically cut and then reconfigured around the development. We had active oil wells on the site that some of which had to be abandoned and then re-drilled um, because of the, the grading that we were doing. And we also had high tension electrical power lines, which uh, basically distributed power um, uh, to the city of Los Angeles. And so, in this particular case, for instance, in uh, this area here, we had some very steep slopes um, that were proposed. We had to make a design 
of those slopes would not affect the stability of those power lines. So as an engineering geologist, that's part of what I do is to go in and, and verify that conditions are gonna be okay for the proposed, both the existing development and as the proposed development. Uh, one of the things I talked earlier about active faults in Southern California, and this site had an active fault that cut right through, well, kind of the Southern boundary of the site. So part of what I did as an act as an engineering geologist was to determine the trace of that active fault. So by looking at cuts, existing cuts and making new cuts, um, we were able to determine the location of that active uh, fault trace and make sure that no new buildings were built on top of that, no, no habitable structures. And what you see off to that left, off to the left of the slide, that photo there with some people standing in a trench. That trench was a, a trench that we constructed, or I, I basically helped excavate um, with equipment and another job site, but would have been very similar to what we did out here on this job site. So in this particular case, trench is about 15 feet deep, and we will physically log each one of those vertical surfaces and then try to determine where the active faults um, penetrate ground surface. And, and from there, we can determine the active fault trace. And then one of the other challenges about, about this site is there were over 50 landslides on the site. So landslides everywhere. Um, I've mapped here on this particular photo three of the larger landslides that we had to uh, basically mitigate. And in most cases, when you're trying to mitigate a, a, a landslide on this type of a project where you're moving a lot of dirt, you're basically gonna remove all of the landslide. But in order to do that, you have to know the depth of the landslide. So we had to, we had to um, basically drill each one of these landslides. And in Southern California, a technique that we use for exploration on, on landslides is what's called bucket auger borings. And you see that to the left, you see a, a geologist being lowered down into a 24 inch uh, borehole. And so the idea here is you drill through the landslide down to what you think is its depth and a little bit beyond. And then a geologist is lowered down hole and then we'll physically map, almost basically make a stratigraphic column of what they see down hole, trying to delineate both uh, bed, bedding, uh, fractures, faults, and most important, why does that basal landslide claim? Where is that at? And that, that's important so that you can put that information in your final report and give that to, to the developers so they know where, where they have to go and what, how deep they're gonna have to go. And here's a photo of kind of the finished product. Looks really nice in the foreground is Golden Valley Road. Uh, in, in the background, the top of the photo, you can see the new Golden Valley High School. And then uh, midway is this housing track that was developed uh, in conjunction with both the high school and, and the roadway itself. So this, the final product here was a 1.2 mile roadway that was part of an initial cross country or cross valley connector system that has, has, has since been completed. And then Matt, why don't you talk about maybe some of the stuff that you might see on a similar type of project from an environmental yeah. standpoint. So environmentally, if uh, Dean's project happened in the early 2000s, which was before a lot of the environmental permitting was taken into place for surface water discharges or stormwater, it's called. Um, that's the, the rainwater that falls on the Earth's surface that combines with sediment, especially on construction sites, and can flow uh, discharge to storm drains that eventually go into creeks and rivers. And in California, the discharge or the stormwater discharges uh, or stormwater flows are heavily regulated by the state of California because a lot of the rivers in California have too much sediment in them and too much, too much of other pollutants like organic compounds or metals or organochlorine pesticides or uh, other types of chemicals of concern that could impact the ecology of streams. So, um, so whereas Dan, Dean's project was mainly in the early 2000s, if that project had been happening in the present day, it would have been subject to a lot of environmental permits, including this construction general permit for sites that are over an acre in size. And pictured in the background, you can just see different kinds of stockpiles and 
operations or silt fence in the top right. That's a type of sediment control measure. And you have a, on the left, you have a, a porta potty, which if you tip that over, you're going to get E. coli that could go into the um, storm drain and all sorts of bad things could get into uh, the area where the fish swim. So next slide, Dean. And there's other types of what we refer to as best management practices on construction sites. And this is a job of the environmental consultant really is to diagnose which of these are, which best management practice is used to mitigate the pollution of surface water into like streams from construction sites. And there's different types of best management practices for construction sites. One of the most predominant one is erosion control cover, which is pictured in the top left where somebody's spraying a green dyed solution, like a tackifier or a hydro seed onto an earth surface to limit the interaction between soil particles and rain droplets. And then in other locations, we have a silt fence that's uh, the center left. Um, and then in the top next to that dumpster, there's can see concrete material and then the bottom left there's stucco washout material that you use when you're building homes and um, these contain the stucco washout material that you use when you're putting stucco on buildings or finalizing the paint can get mixed into the storm water and then go into a storm drain and that is uh, is is highly regulated to not happen in California next and there's like can get into major trouble in California if you don't comply with these environmental regulations. And uh, next slide. So one of the major ways that people get into trouble is by not providing erosion control cover. So Dean was talking about a site that's about 100 acres in size, which is a pretty large square area of exposed soil during mass grading, where you're moving a lot of the dirt and making it all in equal elevation. So uh, developers in, in home construction companies are required to put in some amount of erosion control, which reduces the interaction of rain with soil particles. And uh, there are massive fines for not doing this kind of activity. Next slide, Dean. Uh, other things that can be a problem for construction sites is the discharge of stuff of water that isn't storm water. In this case, we had a we we're developing a, a several hundred acre piece of land to put in a new community. And as part of putting in new communities, you have to put in water systems for directing potable water to the new homes. And you can get leaks in the subsurface pipes that are 15 or 20 feet underground. In this case, we had a leaking pipe carrying some chlorinated water that was about 15 feet under the earth's surface. And uh, at first, we just noticed that on the construction site that there was water trickling up to the surface like a spring. We didn't know where that water was coming from. And we tested it. It was full of chlorine. And then we realized that it was part of this um, flushing that we were doing of the potable water supply for this new development like Dean's. And that we had to treat, um, it was going into a storm drain and then discharging to a river. And that wasn't any good. And so we had to perform emergency response. And this is something that you have to report to the state of California. And if you don't, you can get massive penalties. And even if something like this happens, you can get into trouble. Next slide, Dean. So there are a lot of environmental regulations in California, and as an environmental geologist, you need to know a lot of them about how to collect samples, how to implement on construction sites for surface water compliance, best management practices. In one case, this is just a couple of years ago, one of our developers who's developing a couple hundred acre lot for a new resort got fined about $5 million for not doing performing these surface water best management practices that I was talking about. And it led to a lot of sediment getting into a river and that eventually got into the ocean and affected the wildlife. And, um, and in these construction sites, you can get charged a minimum of $10,000 per day per violation. And some of these permits are hundreds of pages in length containing many provisions. Um, you can also get charged $10 per gallon of discharged water 
So let's assume you had 6.6 .6 million gallons of sediment laden stormwater for one stormwater season. That's that's a lot of that, that could be 66 million dollars in uh, fines. So there's a big need for environmental geologists and engineering geologists. And Dean's probably going to talk about something a little bit more interesting and close to your heart as engineering geologists. Go ahead, Dean. Yeah, so so the next project that that uh, we're going to talk about here are movie studio stages and in, in construction, um, a, as well as uh, environmental mitigation. So I, I've been fortunate enough in, in my career to do a, a lot of work out at Universal Studios. Uh, the project we're going to talk about today is is a uh, major stage development that was done in 2015 to 2018. Um, two separate stage buildings that we were able to, to, to work on. Um, the site challenges uh, for this particular site included seismic uh, liquefaction, uh, lateral spread or landsliding into the adjacent Los Angeles River, and then uh, deep, deep foundation design to, to mitigate against that liquefaction. Um, here is a, a photo of the completed stage development. Uh, these uh, Universal Studios, along with a lot of the other studios in Southern California, were developed all in the early 1910s. Um, in the case of Universal Studios, because not only is it a, a movie studio, not only do they film uh, movies and television shows there, it's also a theme park. There's constant development going on out at Universal Studios where they are tearing old, old stages down or old buildings down and building new development. On this particular project, it was primarily a, a, a parking lot that we put the new the, uh, stages on. But you'll see in the foreground there, a, a lake, a small lake. Well, that lake was used, has been used in, in many uh, television and movie films. Uh, one that's probably known better than a lot of others was an old horror a movie called The Creature of the Black Lagoon. So if any of you have ever seen that movie, that, that is the Black Lagoon there that was, that was used for the, for the movie. Uh, here, here is a, a map of the site. In yellow are the two uh, buildings we, we constructed. Uh, in blue is the Los Angeles River. And in the prior slide, I don't know how many others, but the river itself is channelized. So it's completely cemented in. Uh, nine, probably nine months out of the year, there's very little water other than um, water that's draining from, from uh, basically neighborhoods into the river. And it's only really until December, uh, uh, January, and February before you'll see any significant water. But at any rate, when the, the design of this particular project, because we had liquid, potential liquefaction during a large major earthquake, that liquefaction could also cause what's called lateral spread or landsliding of the site into the Los Angeles River. So even though they've got concrete walls, those concrete walls weren't built to, to uh, mitigate against a, a land movement. They were just mitigate there to build, build for uh, water containment. So part of what we came up with for our design on the project was to use a soil cement uh, columns to both build a buttress in front of the building. So in, be, in between the buildings and the river, and that buttress acted as a mechanism to keep the, the site from sliding into the river. And we also use soil cement columns to uh, build the foundations of the buildings on. Now, the trick to the soil cement columns is they need to be drilled all the way to bedrock depth. So as part of my job as an engineering geologist, I'm involved in the exploration, both with CPTs as well as borings on the site to determine the depth of bedrock on the site, because that's important for the soil cement column uh, depths. And then uh, this next slide here shows us putting in the soil cement columns in, in the buttress area. So in between the buildings and, and the Los Angeles River, which you can see there in, in the background. You can see there, there's not much water in that river other than that small channel there right through the middle. This machine here is an excavator that's been fit with a drilling attachment. And you can see to the, in the middle of this, the screen, 
kind of some paddles on the bottom of that drilling attachment. And so what the machine will do is drill down. In this particular case, it's an eight foot diameter boring. It mixes up soil as it's going down. It's gonna go all the way down to bedrock. And then as a geologist, you're on site to make sure that you're seeing bedrock start to pop, pop out at some point. And at that point, you can tell the driller, stop drilling. At that point, the driller then will start to inject cement into the borehole. And then they will take that, that paddle and they'll spin that in reverse and they'll mix the soil cement with the soil. And that's when you get a soil cement column. They'll take that up and down a few times and then go on to the next one adjacent to it. So that's how you get a soil cement column. And then on this particular project, the, the, as I said earlier, the stages were some of the largest that had been built at Universal Studios. And this was one of those stages right after construction was completed. They're cleaning up the floors, getting ready for the first shoot. Um, uh, for the, so for the final solution, we had the stage buildings. Uh, the deep foundations were composed of four to eight foot diameter soil cement columns that were extended all the way to bedrock. And then the parcel itself, the land that it was built on, was stabilized against lateral spread with a buttress composed of eight foot diameter soil columns. Uh, the buttress itself was about 250 feet long and about 25 feet wide. And then Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about problems you've seen with, with studio buildings that you've worked on? Yeah, and I've worked on other, other studios in Los Angeles and, um, you know, one of the issues that you face in Los Angeles is the uh, migration of soil vapors into indoor air, soil gas. Uh, this is caused by chemicals in the subsurface like chlorinated solvents, also called volatile organic compounds, or could be petroleum products underground that allow uh, gas migration upwards through the soil column and into buildings. And in California, this is highly regulated and and a lot of care is taken to ensure that there aren't any, uh, there isn't a certain amount of contamination getting into the breathing zone that could affect human health. Next slide. And one way that we're able to assess the migration of soil gas uh, in the subsurface is by collecting what are called subslab soil gas samples or soil vapor samples from the subsurface. These. In the picture in the top right and kind of in the center there, we've uh, this is in one studio where we had drilled little holes in the ground and then pulled air samples out of the subslab environment by hooking up a pre-evacuated steel canister that is essentially under vacuum. And as soon as you hook it up to that probe, you're able to uh, pull an air sample out of the subslab and into the can. And then you send that can off to a laboratory to analyze for chlorinated solvents or other chemicals of concern. And you're able to detect down to uh, like a part per billion range for how much of a certain organic compound there is. This is one way of assessing and uh, assessing the effectiveness of soil vapor extraction systems or subslab depressurization systems, which are systems employed to remove vapors from the subsurface. Next slide. And one way that we assess, or let's say you had a building and there was a vapor intrusion problem where chemicals were getting into the breathing zone. One way, one thing that we do in California is called soil vapor extraction, where we'll drill these vertical wells that can range in depth from uh, you know, 10 feet to 300 feet in depth. And we put in these slotted perforated PVC pipes that we drill down. This is a hollow stem auger rig where we're drilling inside. And we have, you can see all our stockpiled material for backfilling the well. And uh, we put in these vertical wells to extract air from the subsurface. You can also put in these vertical wells for groundwater monitoring or air sparging, a mechanism to clean up contaminated groundwater. Next slide, Dean. In all this, the soil vapor extraction and these, what I referred to as subslab depressurization are systems that remove organic compounds from the subsurface. And uh, we're doing this to satisfy regulatory compliance with the state of California really, and to ensure that the breathing air inside of these warehouses where there, where there is um, potential risk for vapor intrusion that the occupants are protected. 
pictured in the center is the soil vapor extraction system where we have two uh, vertical wells hooked up to a vacuum blower system, which is the vacuum blowers in the bottom left. And then that air passes through two giant tanks of tanks of organic of uh, carbon, and and that carbon adsorbs chemicals to the particles of the carbon before allowing the air to pass through a flexible hose and emit to the atmosphere. So this is just some of the primary ways that we remediate the subsurface and avoid uh, migration of harmful chemicals into the breathing zone. And Dean, why don't you transverse into the next slide set we have going for uh, the Motion Picture Academy Museum. Sure. So this is the third project that we want to talk about. And both Matt and I worked on various phases of either this project or, or a project right next door to this project. This was the new Mo Academy of Motion Pictures Museum and Theater that was built in uh, 2016. The design that, that I worked on was in 2014, 2015. And it was a a design where they used an existing uh, department store that was built in 1939. And in, in that photograph in the lower left-hand corner of the slide, you can see the department store off to the right. And then they built a brand new spherical building, which is the theater that they're going to use for future Academy Awards presentations. So you can see that to the, to the left, that's that spherical building that many people here in Southern California refer to as the Death Star, and if you're familiar with, with Star, Wars, Star Wars, you'll understand that reference. Um, the challenges for this particular site included uh, tar sands, uh, pile in, deep pile installation or, or subterranean pile installation, and high groundwater. Uh, and so let's talk a little bit about tar sands. This is a, a slightly unusual thing, but in Southern California, we had talked earlier about, Matt had talked earlier about oil development and oil well development. And this is a, a picture from the, just north of the site back in the 1920s. So you're looking um, to the north uh, towards the Hollywood Hills. So you can see the hills there in the background, but in the foreground, you see uh, four oil wells. And so this site was located in what was called the Salt Lake oil field. Um, and within about a half a mile of the site, there were dozens, at one time, dozens of wells um, that were operating and pumping oil. Uh, since that time, most of those wells have been abandoned within the city of Los Angeles and the Los Angeles area, but there are still active wells within, within the city, and most of them are now covered or they've got structures built around them, but they're still there and they're still pumping, pumping oil. Uh, this is the site underneath the, the new uh, uh, theater building. We had to do an excavation about 40 feet deep down below that, that proposed theater. And what you'll see here uh, are the two, kind of the two bigger issues we had on the site. One is the tar sands. In, in the, the photo to the lower left, you can actually see some of those tar sands that were excavated. That's that black, dark gray material. And that is sand that is basically saturated with, with tar. And then also in the excavation in that photo to the right, you can see groundwater. Well, we had pump, groundwater on the site typically is around eight feet below ground surface. So to dig an excavation like that, we have to dewater the site. And in order to dewater the site, we have to install a number of wells. And those wells then oftentimes require a, a lot of maintenance because they then become clogged with, with tar and petroleum. So that was, that was a big challenge in making sure all of that was, was kept, kept running. Um, we talked a little bit earlier about putting in piles underneath that existing uh, department store. The department store was built in 1939. Um, prior to really a good understanding of the seismic hazards, the big seismic hazards in, in Southern California, and of course the seismic uh, knowledge that we've gained in mod modern day um, studies. But so as part of using this old building, we had to install new piles to protect against any uh, future earthquakes. Now, this is a photo here of the subterranean uh, area below that building with a crew installing, uh, drilling, pop, drilling for, for new piles. And you can see everyone's wearing uh, protective clothing and that's 
because of the tar sands and the petroleum related in that, you can see people are getting pretty dirty. And the other thing that you can't see in the picture though, is everybody is also wearing a respirator. And the reason they're wearing a respirator is because of the toxic gases that are being produced by, by the tar sands in, in, this, in this area. Matt's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then here's a picture of the final building once, it's, once it was completed. The, the theater off to the left, and then the existing uh, or the pre existing department store um, from 1939 off to the right, and then the construction or the, the connection between the two buildings. Um, and then, part of you know, one of the things I really enjoy about working in Southern California and, and many of the buildings we get to work on is that some of them are iconic structures, and oftentimes you'll get to see a building or structure that you worked on in a movie or in a television show. And that's that's kind of, to me, is really cool. It's one of the things I really enjoy about being a, an engineering geologist here in Southern California. So all of that dirt is now gone. And here's what the final the final product looked like. I think it came out pretty nice. And Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about your project? Sorry, I owe a dollar in the bucket for being on mute. Um, um, I, uh, I worked on a project really close to Dean's, uh, adjacent to what are referred to as La Brea tar pits, which is an area of naturally occurring tar that seeps up to the surface. And early on in the days of the dinosaurs, these, uh, pots of liquid tar would trap animals in them, like saber-toothed tigers or dinosaurs. They'd get trapped in these piles of tar. And then their bones would get preserved in the record, and um, and that's a hazard that they face the dinosaurs. But more recently, the hazards that are faced in by the humans when you're excavating through this material is um, other hydrogen sulfide and methane gases, like Dean was mentioning. There's other environmental concerns um, during excavation. One of them that we need to manage is dewatering. So we put in these vertical dewatering pipes. Uh, wells throughout a, an excavation area. This is one where we are excavating down to the top of groundwater around 40 feet below ground surface to put in a basement like Dean's. Very similar. We did the same kind of shoring, may have done, been done by the same contractor. Um, and, uh, and you have to dewater that water and send it through a treatment train before you discharge it to the storm drain or the sanitary sewer. Um, and there's a lot of regulations that environmental geologists and engineers are, need to be aware of. Next slide, Dean. And these oil seeps that I was mentioning before produce some um, difficult conditions for the excavation of soils because you can excavate into patches of extremely dangerous hydrogen sulfide gas. And for that reason, uh, all the workers in this excavation pit were wearing hydrogen sulfide meters and methane meters to make sure that the breathing concent the concentrations of those gases in the immediate working zone were safe. And this was partly in compliance with the uh, environmental regulations in California. Um, there's other environmental regulations that uh, like there's air permits that regulate where this soil can go. So you excavate a 40 foot deep hole um, and then you have to put all that soil somewhere. So one place that that soil goes is to landfills, but there are different kinds of landfills for different types of soil based on the chemical concentrations in that soil and, and how gassy it is. So if it's giving off a lot of fumes, might need to go to one landfill and, instead of another. Next slide, Dean. And on this project, this is about 40 feet below ground surface. Uh, we were just above the top of groundwater. And uh, the project required extensive geotechnical design that a company like Dean's would have been responsible for because what happens is that below these the foundations of these buildings, you need to drill what are called piles. And you drill down in a similar way to what Dean was describing to create these soil cement columns where you drill down and inject uh, cement and put steel rods in these vertical pipes or vertically uh, drilled like 24, 36, 48 inch boreholes that go down quite deep. 
And uh, because of the tarry soil on our site, we had a lot of issues with maintaining the integrity of those structures of those because the tar was oozing into the soil cement column, producing effect that wasn't allowing the integrity of that pile to be maintained. So you had to redrill them. A lot of environmental and geotechnical issues that arise from this project, and I'm sure on Dean's as well. Next slide, Dean. Other tasks of environmental geologists uh, in the realm of excavation monitoring, this is a whole field of environmental compliance in California is about monitoring the excavations of soils and documenting what you remove from the soil, what kind of concentrations there were in the soil, making sure that the excavation fully captured all of the contaminated dirt. In this case, we are excavating down about 20 feet and, um, and we were excavating because there was petroleum releases in the soil and we wanted to put a new building on top of this land that was formerly used for manufacturing electrical transformers. And we were able to excavate out all that soil, but we had to collect, you have to collect soil samples from the sidewalls of the trench and from the bottom of the trench to confirm that you removed all the contamination. Next slide. And then finally, there's other types of excavation projects that require tents to be put around the excavation area. In this case, we had hazardous materials, hazardous substances with polychlorinated biphenyls and asbestos in a concrete structure that we were trying to extract. And we had to put up this giant tent to ensure that air particles containing asbestos weren't going to get in, trained into the air and pass over into the neighboring communities. And with that, Dean, why don't we go on to our wrap up section? Yeah, so we talked about three projects today, the Golden Valley Road, uh, it, which represents a common large scale grading uh, development here in Southern California. Talked about Universal Studios, which represents a commercial, typical commercial development. On In this particular case, it was oriented towards the studios or Hollywood. And then we talked about the Academy Museum, which is a site that's got naturally occurring hazardous materials. So those are, uh, while not super common in, in the Los Angeles area, there are these areas that, that have both uh, uh, petroleum related hydrocarbons as well as other naturally occurring uh, hazardous materials. I think um, in my 35 years of, of experience that I've had, my takeaways from the projects that I've, I've uh, completed here in Southern California are kind of the following is, is one is to know the geology of the site. I know that sounds a little bit oversimplified, but especially for a large grading site where you're moving uh, uh, millions of yards or, or meters, cubic meters of material, you really need to know what you're going to get into before you start to move. And the reason for that is you don't want to get halfway down a slope base like you see here and then find out the conditions of what you thought might have been a stable slope is an unstable slope because all of a sudden you're going to have to go back and redesign as you've got contractors there wanting to move dirt. Um, the second is to know your client, know what your client's restrictions are, know what their schedule is, and know what their assumptions are for the project. They may have certain ideas as to how that project is going to progress. They have, may, may have certain budgets. Know and make sure that your mitigation, proposed mitigation, is going to work with their budget, with their schedule. And then third is to anticipate your problems. Um, especially in areas where there might be something a little bit unusual. Think about what your problems are going to be or potential problems are going to be before you get into the actual uh, construction of the project. Make sure you've got all of that figured out and make sure you might have alternatives to a problem that that pops up. And then let's, uh, Matt, let's talk about your, your sites. Yeah, so I think overall um, in environmental geology profession in California and in Southern California, we um, you know, protection of human health is the primary concern for almost all of our investigations and almost all of the business that's derived in Southern California. And a lot of that relates to vapor intrusion mitigation to remove the concentrations of gas that's accumulating into the indoor air below the slab of a foundation. Uh, the 
the world of environmental work in California is heavily regulated, and that's a lot of what we are trying to address are regulations. So you have to know your regulations. And if you don't know your regulations for certain projects, especially surface water projects, that can result in pretty massive penalties. Um, so that, with that, I'd like to uh, take us to our closing. Um, you know, in, in, in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, there's a lot more than awards and stars to the discipline of, uh, to the, like what you see on TV. And in a lot of what you see on TV, the underpinning is in environmental and engineering geology, because we need to make sure that buildings are safe to have it, uh, to occupy, like making sure that buildings aren't built on active faults and that there aren't gases that are accumulating inside of the indoor air of the, uh, of the breathing zone. And there's always a need for geologists in Southern California. It's a, it's a thriving economy. We have so much development happening here that, um, that there's always a need for geoscientists. With that, I'll, we, I think we'll take any questions or answers and answer any questions that exist. Yeah, uh, I'd like to first of all start by thanking you all, um, the speakers, for their excellent and informative talks. And of course, we can take the questions from the participants and you can write on chat. Uh, we have also live on YouTube. I can take the questions from there. Um, I think it's necessary here to note that uh, all sides have different, different characteristics <laughs> so that different remedial measures are required. Uh, so thank you for sharing your experiences uh, in your site. You're, you're quite welcome. And I, I hope that um, what Matt and I have been able to talk about this today has, has been informative to other people around the globe who may practice geology uh, in a much different manner than what we do here in, in Southern California. Yeah. So um, may I ask you a question? <laughs> um, nobody is asking anything now, for now. Um, you mentioned that soil cement columns should be applied until bedrock, um, but what do you suggest for the sites that the soil depth is greater than 100 meters or much greater than this thickness? So uh, I think it's economically uh, impossible to put the columns until bedrock. Yeah, in, in many cases, we will design um, structures with piles or columns that uh, will terminate within the soil. Um, in this particular case that I talked about, the soil cement columns, um, th those were end bearing columns. And, but in many cases for pile, pile um, projects, especially within the city of Los Angeles, they won't even allow us to use the end bearing value of the piles. They all have to be designed with uh, what's called skin friction. So your, 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 your total um, support is based on skin friction or side friction of the piles and you get nothing on uh, end bearing values. So that in many cases will make your pile lengths longer than, than other places where you'd be able to use end bearing, but it's still done and that's how it's done typically at least in the, in the city of Los Angeles. And there's a reason for that. I don't know the exact reason as to why they do that. I think a lot of it has to do with past um, problems that they've had with uh, consultants, I'm sorry, not consultants, but contractors installing piles incorrectly. So does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay. So um, there is another question on the chat and, um, from Clarence. How do you cope with the near fault problem? You mentioned that there is a regulation that forbids constructing on a fault. And how do the regulation define whether something is on the fault? Would you describe the general procedure that is sufficient when you already know uh, that a fault is near? So the fault, basically the fault 
the active faults are, have been, in many cases, most cases defined by the um, state of California, by geologists working for the state. As a consultant, we're going to come in and try to better determine the location of those faults. So the state's going to define the location typically by geomorphology or by uh, uh, looking at air photos. Uh, we will come in as geologists and we're going to use different techniques. And one of the most common techniques that we can use where we have the, the site is to dig a trench across the fault. Uh, or what we think is the known fault area. And we can then look for fractures or, or cracks within the, the, the ground. Typically those are vertical or near vertical. And then look for offset soils along those fractures. And where we see those offset soils, then what we can do is date the soil material using typically carbon 14 dating, but there's other methods and then determine what the ages of the, I guess it would really be the oldest material that's been, uh, the youngest material that's been offset, I guess. So you might see a fault that comes in through alluvial materials and then dies out. And then you would date the material above that area where that fault dies out. And let's say the date of that material was 10,000 years old. Then you could say, well, the last earthquake was before 10,000 years ago. And that's the way you de determine it. So oftentimes on a larger project, you're going to dig a number of trenches to basically connect the dots across the project and then come up with a delineation as to where those that the, the zone of activity would be. And in California, the general line is you cannot build within 50 feet of an active fault. So once you've determined the, the zone of uh, of deformation and activity, then you make it 50 feet wider to either side, and then nothing can be built. No ha habitable structures can be built on top of that active zone. And hopefully that answers that question. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, the date of the material is higher than 10,000 years, so it's not active. You uh, decide on that. And uh, do you take a buffer zone? Actually, so so the the buffer the buffer zone would be uh, again fifty feet to either side of the active fault trace, um, okay. and so you would typically you might see a a buffer zone that's anywhere from maybe it's a hundred hundred feet wide to um, it could be a few hundred feet wide depending on the width of the active zone. Okay. Um, and it, it's really dependent on how complex that zone of faulting is. Oftentimes it's going to be very narrow, but sometimes, for instance, I've worked on the San Andreas Fault, which is a plate boundary where you have uh, faults that shoot off of the main trace and you basically end up establishing a number of uh, setback zones, not only on the main fault, but on these, on these spurs that come off of the main zone. Yeah, thank you. And also there is another question. Um, what are the remedial measures for large quantities of torsin? Matt, you wanna get that one? Yeah, so um, in uh, my experience, a lot of the tar, it produces methane and hydrogen sulfide that isn't, it, some of it gets to the surface and some of it doesn't, some of it stays at depth. So in these 40 foot deep trenches, or uh, excavation areas, you might have a different, you have, might have different chemicals getting into the basement than you do in a you know slab on grade, something that's like a house. And currently what we would do is, there's one method of putting in impermeable barriers, which are essentially rubber liners that you put on the basement, um, in the basement of the building or just above, right below where you put the slab. And that stops the vapors from coming in um, immediately below the footprint. That doesn't always stop vapors from, if you have a 40 foot deep trench or a basement, it doesn't stop the vapors from coming in on each side of it, just kind of stops on the bottom barrier. And other mechanisms are, if you're building something closer to grade to the ground surface, you can put in these, uh, horizontal slotted pipes, they're called, or 
referred to as subslab depressurization systems, um, where you put in horizontal pipes, you put them within a base rock, a gravelly material, a coarse grain material underneath of the slab of the building. And then you put the building on top and then and those pipes are routed up to the roof and they can either be hooked up to a vacuum system or they can just be allowed to naturally vent out through these a series of pipes up to the roof and uh, and then off gas the gas buildup or uh, like vent off the gas buildup from under, underneath the slab and those are two two methods that remediate that to remove that risk to indoor air and Dean, maybe you've seen others. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, certain buildings I've worked on will have a ventilation system with, with inside the building. And also they'll have what's called a, a methane monitoring system within the building so that if the methane levels go above a certain level, you'll get an alarm that goes off, which basically tells people to get out of the building. So that has become common. I've worked on some sites, um, actually down at Los Angeles International Airport, which is in a methane hazard zone where we had to do exactly that. We had to um, get the site or the building wired up with this, this um, ventilation system and these, and these uh, monitors. Right, and a lot of the time those methanes, in those methane zones, what Dean is describing, those buildings would be latched on to something like a subslab depressurization system or another way, there would be some way to off vent, off gas or vent out the subslab gas buildup. So if that system wasn't being effective and gas was getting inside of the building, then a massively loud alarm would go off inside the building. And that, that, a lot of that was based on an explosion that occurred in the 1980s when they were building a section of subways in Los Angeles where a building next to where they were doing some excavation filled with uh, the basement of the building filled with methane gas and the building exploded. Um, and so, uh, which basically because of that ended tunneling in the city of Los Angeles for a period of about 20 years uh, before they could start building the new sections of subways. There was such paranoia associated with that. They basically shut down any tunneling within the city of Los Angeles. So uh, very, very critical uh, structures to have those methane monitors within buildings in the areas where they need them. It looks like there's another question as far yeah. as where does where does the excavated contaminated spoils go? Matt, you want to talk about that? Yeah, so it it varies. It depends on the level of contamination, um, and really a lot of it the air and these are guided by air permits. So there's a California or in Southern California, we have a Southern California Air Quality Management District, which regulates all the emissions to the atmosphere, including like cars, and then also like soils that give off fumes. And that could go to uh, different kinds of landfills, mostly non-hazardous landfills, but we also have hazardous waste landfills. And each landfill has different waste acceptance criteria. So some landfills won't accept um, high VOC soil or high or soil with a lot of volatile organic compounds in them, whereas other landfills might. That, but it, it and it kind of relates to how expensive disposing that soil is going to go is going to be because um, certain hauling contract there's only certain hauling contractors that are allowed to haul high VOC soil or highly contaminated soil, and you have to make sure that covers are on them or that they're in lined bins within uh, the, the truck that's carrying the soil out. So sometimes these, these uh, you know, you might need to drive 400 miles to dispose of this dirt. So I don't know what that is in kilometers exactly, but it's pretty far. You might need to drive a full day, have one truck that drives 30 tons of soil in one day it takes them eight hours to drive to the waste landfill. And then they have to do a round trip and come back to that, to that um, area where the soil contaminated soil comes from. And you might have to haul a hundred trucks of soil off your contaminated site. And that leads to a lot of back and forth with these trucks to and from uh, waste landfill. So it all depends on what the level of contamination is 
and um, the availability of drivers and then which landfills are going to accept that waste based on the, the chemical constituents and physical properties of that soil. Um, yeah, I think a relevant question. Is there a pilot hole for the bucket of that boring? No, there isn't. They drill down with, typically it's a 24 inch, um, uh, what's called a bucket auger. And that works, basically they'll drill down about a foot to a foot and a half at a time, bring that bucket back up to the surface, dump the material. There's a trap door out of the bottom of the bucket. They dump the material and then go back down in the hole. But there, there is typically no, I've never seen it used before where there's a pilot hole for the bucket auger board. So are they always 100% vertical? No, there is oftentimes a little bit of a, a tilt or a slant to the boreholes, um, but it's usually within a degree or two of, of vertical. Yeah, thank you for your answers. And if no one has anything else to add, so I guess uh, we will finish here. And again, uh, I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to be here today. And I wish that we will meet again on our next webinar. So uh, thank you again. And I will close this meeting. Have a good day. And thank you. Thank you for the inv invitation. Yes, thank you. We thank.